have a list of some answer, canned responses if you have any questions about why the Bible is the way it is. So how many of you are actually using EPUB at present or producing? How many are producing EPUBs? Quite a few, which is good. How many have looked in the files that are inside the EPUB? The same number of people practically, that's even better. <laughs> okay, so the previous time I talked about EPUBs to a different audience, uh, I introduced it saying that Uh, we, we turned five French Bibles into EPUB so that you could read it on a handheld device, an iPhone, a dedicated reader, or a web browser. But since this is XML Prague, I can say we turned the SFM markup, which is essentially the source code for Bibles, for printing um, codes that start with backslashes or vertical bars, into a standard XML for Bibles, which is called OSIS. And from there, we, we produced uh, EPUB, which, as those of you who have looked inside your EPUB will know, is essentially three files. There's XHTML with the content. There's the NCX file, um, which is the table of contents that you see in the table of contents pane. And the OPF file, OPF is the manifest of what's in the document and the linear reading order. So to our shame, we started with the approach of how hard can it be when we're asked to turn five Bibles into EPUB. Uh, currently up to about seven Bibles and 17 versions in total. But uh, we looked at the sample files. We had one file from each of four books, or four Bibles. And at first glance, it appears that the Bibles are well structured. There's a testament which contain the books. The books contain the chapters. Chapters have paragraphs and poetry, and the verses are in there somewhere. We even had documentation for the SFM codes that we had. The reality, as we found it, is that yes, Bibles contain testaments. They also contain introductions, glossaries, etc. A bunch of other stuff we had to handle. We hadn't even seen the external notes or the glossaries when we agreed to do the work. The Testaments, yes, they do contain books. They also have their own introductions. And the books within a Testament can be arranged in hierarchies. The, the first five books be grouped together with a title and their own introduction, etc. We knew that books contained chapters. We found they also contained introductions, sections within chapters as well as sections that contain the chapters. The chapters contain what we figured, paragraphs and poetry. We found that, contrary to the King James Version, modern Bibles have tables and things in it. Um, we had to incorporate footnotes, etc. Even within the paragraphs and the poetry, we found things that surprised, including chapters. One of our versions had a chapter break in the middle of a paragraph, which is a bit disconcerting when you're making an EPUB that is broken into one chapter per file. Some other things I didn't know existed, uh, for example, the Hebrew annotations, which reflect the original Hebrew origins of the Old Testament. Verses, yes, they contain text, there's highlights, there's glossary terms. An interesting feature um, is that some Bibles, well, to start with the SFM, what you have is just a little symbol that says, yes, this is a glossary term, and there's often no relationship between what's in the glossary in the printed book and what's marked as a glossary term in the text. And it could be a multi-word glossary term, but you have no indication from the SFM because that little star is all you have on the page. And some of them put the glossary term at the end of the multi-word term, and some of them put it at the start of the multi-word term. So that was interesting. Footnotes, sometimes there's footnote markers, sometimes there isn't. Um, we also found that different versions of the Bibles had different sequences. The Catholic Bible has more books than the, the average Protestant Bible, and then some versions um, have a completely different ordering of the books. I didn't know there was a Psalm 151, but in some traditions there is. And 
there's the Catholic version of the Catholic um, Deuto canonicals have an extra Daniel. So sometimes our Bible can have two books of Daniel and sometimes they helpfully merge this in one and in one version we were given um, they gave us two different Daniels but they didn't actually tell us it was two different Daniels until we found there was a file that wasn't being processed so we had to go back and add something for that so then let's what, what review what everybody knows about chapter numbers we know that chapters start at one doesn't always happen chapters are numeric not in some Bibles there's always a chapter number not in the very short books and there is only one of every chapter well no and verse numbers how can you go wrong verse numbers start at one not uh, there's, there's verse numbers that happen in sequence well no in, in this case there's a book in I mean a verse which is in the Bible but it's not in the original sources so this version helpfully puts it in a footnote uh, verses are sort of there's a verse start and there's a verse end not always sometimes you start here and then the end of the verse is like six verses later in part 6b so all this was in our standard format markers um, standard format markers are so standardized that they're now working on something called unified standard format markers because it's not really standardized the advice from the experts was first clean your data which wasn't an option for us because the Bible Society still wants to produce printed Bibles from the same SFM and we had to make some changes sometimes there's errors in their SFM and there's going to be our own day of reckoning where we have to meet up with the Bible Society and justify the changes that we did so that standardizing our standard format markers wasn't an option I said we had documentation they provided what are called Belize's where they helpfully marked out the codes that they used except as you can see sometimes they didn't bother doing that and we soon found that the documentation as it was was more of a guide than a reference because you found uh, codes that weren't in the um, in the documentation and you found for example that one translation had three different ways of marking up tables using the same codes that you have to handle so yes SFM codes are sort of documented the other assumption we had was that looking at our sample files was they all start a line they don't we had to add another processing stage to sort this one out and you would think that they all mean the same thing except in one Bible two slashes means this is a nice place to put a line break when you're printing in another Bible it means this is a cross-reference to the parallel text in another gospel and we started out thinking that the um, the SFM was just codes and then we found they started putting in extra bits like one of these broken verses so the 6a we want the a in italics we'll just put it in the verse number but despite all that there were more similarities than differences in what we did oops sorry wrong way so how did we do it? We used XSLT 2.0 all the way through. We treated our SFM as unparsed text, read it in, used a real expression on line breaks to turn it to turn every line, or actually every line starting with an SFM code into um, one XML document, and then we did the chain of transformations on those sort of adding new features each time. In total, for five books, we have about 50 transforms, some of which are used in every book, some of which are used for only stuff that's in one chapter in one book. And we use Ant to handle the configuration, the, um, setting up which transforms to run 
and who actually runs the XSLT. So I'm not going to show you the whole 23 transforms that can happen in one book. We'll just do some of the highlights. The first step is turning SFM into lines. As I said, every line that starts with a uh, SFM code got turned into uh, just an arbitrary element. So we end up with well-formed XML we can then work with. Through a succession, succession of stages, we add um, additional markup. So partway through the process, you'll see that there's um, markup at this point for the, the structure of the document. And we still have some markup we haven't turned into XML yet. And the uh, codes for the highlighting are there. And then in the bottom of the screen, it's the same text, and it's all in OSIS now. So the sequence that we went for after a bit of experimentation and uh, moving stages around is that we start with the, the high level stuff. We add elements to, for the body, the introduction of the body. Within that we find the sections and then we find the, the chapters. Um, in OSIS you, you, mark, you have milestones for the chapter start and the chapter end rather than a, a um, an element that contains the whole of the chapter, which is helpful considering some of the structures that we had. And then we added the, the first start milestones. Again, it's all done with milestones. Um, some of the time we then had to remove the sections for things like the um, chapter that starts in the middle of a paragraph. We handled notes. We went sort of went from the outside in, eventually handling the stuff that's inside the text. And then finally, we had the verse end milestones because there's rules within OSIS about where to put the verse ends. So OSIS, the acronym I've been using, is Open Scriptural Information Standard. It's um, from a group called BibleTechnologies.net. It was developed by um, experts in the linguistic, theological XML field. Uh, the, one of the co-chairs is Steve DeRose, the editor is Patrick Duracell, so um, many of you would know those two already. There's a strong TEI influence in the markup that's used, but it's actually aimed at the people who are more expert in Bibles than in XML, so the, the, um, the stand itself reads like sort of has a complex description of this is the XML declaration, you need to put it at the front. This is a start tag and this is an end tag. So where OSIS, I mean, um, our client has plans for using the OSIS um, as OSIS and serving um, text online from the OSIS. Where it worked well is it already had structures for the what I would call non-intuitive, other people might call traditional, the, the numbering, the verses that start. Um, chapter verse 14 is the first verse in the chapter, etc. It could also handle um, the multiplicity of verses um, in one sentence. One sentence could cover um, five verses or more. And the split verses that you saw. Where it didn't really work is that uh, they obviously didn't use our Bibles as a source when they're working out how to do the trans, do the markup. Because you're not allowed to put a verse start or end in highlighted text and in um, one of these books. We have one section, it's basically five and a half chapters of highlighted text and the only breaks are the titles and the, uh, the chapter breaks. Again, they, you can't put poetry in line groups, so what in the text is one long thing with poetry with titles interspersed. We've had to put in a separate line groups. Um, it will still look the same, but perhaps it's not the best markup to reflect the intentions of the translator. Which brings me to EPUB in four and a half minutes. So thankfully Mur Murata-san has done EPUB for electronic books from the um, International Digital Publishing Forum. There you go, Henry. Um, it's interesting that people who promote uh, EPUB actually have the broader definition that the ebook is anything that's delivered electronically. 
The advantage is the EPUB is fewer dead trees and it's easier to serve the content. The disadvantage is that at present the book could be just as expensive as something you can hold in your hand, but you don't own it in quite the same way. <laughs> it, there is the example that Amazon for a while there served 1984 as EPUB. They found they, the person who published it didn't have the copyright. So Amazon silently removed it from people's Kindles uh, and credited their account with the, uh, the money they'd paid. They didn't actually tell them. Um, uh, yes, if anyone tells you that an EPUB is just as good as a book, you can read it anywhere, ask them what they read while, during takeoff and landing on an airplane. So uh, ebook is growing. These are figures from the IDPF themselves. This is the wholesale amounts that are being shipped in books. The point about Amazon is not surprising. They sold more um, ebooks and paperbacks uh, the last quarter last year. The fact, the surprising thing is that it surprised even Amazon how many they sold. They weren't expecting the crossover point until sometime this year. So EPUB is essentially a zip file, as Murata san said. So the, the, the simplistic thing of how we had to do it, we had the books, we had some external notes, we had the glossary, we had to put them into the separate um, publications, the Catholic version with the notes, the Catholic version without Protestant, with and without notes. Except sometimes there's cross-references to content which isn't in the edition you're actually producing. So in some cases, for example, we produce four different versions of the glossary depending on the target version that it's going into. I was going to try and explain the process of how we um, went from we have the books, we have the notes, we, have, we know which version it is, it is, and how we end up with the table of contents, etc. But it was beyond my capacity to explain it to you in 30 minutes, so um, that's why it's beyond my capacity. What we start with for the hierarchy to tell us what's in the books and um, what goes in the table of contents is just this, uh, because thankfully um, there's a lot of similarity between books, so we only have one definition of the actual books in the, in the um, New Testament, for example. From that, the EPUB files, we can produce the table of contents file. Uh, you, you see that you have some of the same titles that you saw in the um, hierarchy file that we have. We've added in the, the books. You also, in the EPUB, need a manifest saying exactly what books are in the EPUB. As Mirata san said, Apple won't accept it if you have extra books or if you're referring to books that don't exist. And there's also the spine in the OPF file, which is a linear reading order. If you kept hitting page down or the next button or the bottom corner of your screen, this is the order in which you'd see the content, which was interesting for us because some of the notes you want to have as part of the linear, linear reading order and some of the notes um, we had to move to the back. Where XSLT worked well for us is some of the logic which might have been hard we found comparatively easy, such as there's rules for, well, there's guidelines for where you should insert um, the verse end market. If, if a verse starts, say, in the first paragraph of the first section of the first chapter of the, of the second chapter, then the, um, the end of the previous verse should be at the end of the preceding paragraph, um, the end of the last paragraph of the last chapter in the um, last paragraph in the previous chapter. So using XPath um, made this comparatively easy. Where XSLT wasn't such a great help is that sometimes we needed to move content from one place to the other, which really means in a transform, you need to do a match to find the place where you want the content to be, and from there you need to locate the content that you want and transform it so it appears at that point in the, in the result. And you also need another template 
for where the content currently is now that just drops the content from the result at that stage. If there's a mismatch in your logic, you could end up with two copies, the new and the old, you can end up with zero. So it's something you need to be careful about. And um, we're the one problem we had is that we had both notes and glossary terms and highlight markup in the text. So um, we had to, pro had to process the notes fairly early because they don't, um, they're not counted in paragraph processing. So we had all these XML between the SFM codes. So we had to sort of do a linear processing of text nodes and XML to work out how to handle the highlights so that the highlights started and then wrapping the XML that we already had. Okay, thank you. Yes, George and then Mike. Hi, Tony. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the XML markup is TI inspired. Uh, TI provides a kind of uh, definition for, for what's inside the old one document does it all format that they, that they develop to generate even the TI itself. Have you used that? You know, it's like a customization of dog book, like a specialization of data is in the same direction. They have this mechanism. You, you have the, the OSIS standard and you have a W3C XML schema for um, OSIS. So uh, it's the, the markup is inspired by um, TI, but the, this this is the documentation, which is I think a word document. <laughs> where you have to do sorry, Michael K. Where you have to do um, manual fix up. Do you integrate that fix up into your automated pipeline, or? So that you can rerun it, or, or, or do it, is it really just manual and by hand at the it, end? It, well, we um, we fix up the source. I mean, fix up is a a broad term. Um, it, one case we we thought we we found something where the um, the markup wasn't working. Oh, there's only like a few of these, so we just fix it up. Um, and then we found another translation that had it all the way through. So um, there are a few manual. You're fixing up at the beginning of the process. Yes, the we we don't we don't we don't tweak um, the OSIS at present. We have a, a requirement to actually uh, we we want to be able to sort of post process the OSIS as text essentially to. Um, to add things like more of the um, additions marker so that we can make conditional content uh, where there isn't any indication of conditional content in the SFM itself. The example from the paper is there is a, um, there's a reference to a note in the SFM and um, the, the, the reference is to something which doesn't appear in the Protestant version and in in the Catholic version it's there and in the printed Protestant version there's square brackets and there's some text which doesn't appear in our SFM but it says to the effect of the Catholics worry about this um, we, we, have, we still have a requirement to um, be able to process the OSIS to add those sort of fix-ups which will have to actually cross markup boundaries because there's square brackets on either side of the um, the reference which we also have to fix up. So there's, um, thankfully the client hasn't delivered that one, hasn't turned that one um, into a delivered ebook yet. We're still, still working with that particular problem. Okay, thank you very much again.